This is a lecture on the biochemistry of photosynthesis. I often like to start these lectures with context. And the context in our case is a big tree. This is a part of my family in front of a Coast Redwood in the Lady Bird Johnson Grove in Redwood National Park in California. Obviously very impressive, magnificent organism. And I think it's helpful when we're diving into the nitty gritty details of photosynthesis to remember the context that these trees and all green plants are built one molecule at a time through the fixation of CO2 by photosynthesis. It's a remarkable fact. It's not a miracle, it's biology, but it seems miraculous that this biochemical reaction through happening billions and billions of times can build a coast redwood and, and that's pretty cool. So that's the context. Let's go ahead and jump into photosynthesis. I really like this definition of photosynthesis in the Kozlowski and Pallardy book. They say that photosynthesis is the process by which light energy is captured by green plants and used to synthesize reduced carbon compounds from carbon dioxide and water. And one of the reasons I like this definition is because it explicitly and separ separately shows the light reactions and dark reactions of photosynthesis. The light reactions are the part of photosynthesis where photons and the energy in photons is captured and then that energy is then basically moved and used in the dark reactions of photosynthesis where CO2 is actually captured and fixed into reduced carbon compounds like glucose. So this definition really, I think, captures the two main parts of the process, and it's a common way of organizing our discussion of the biochemistry of photosynthesis. Another useful thing to think about is the empirical formula for photosynthesis, which demonstrates that CO2 and water with energy input from light produce glucose, that's the empirical formula for glucose and other sugars, with oxygen and water as a byproduct. One thing that's important to remember is that this is just the empirical summary equation for photosynthesis. In, in reality, the photosynthetic dark reactions are a whole series of linked chemical reactions called the Calvin cycle, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I hope throughout this class it becomes apparent that structure and function are intimately connected. So by structure, I mean the shape, arrangement, uh, and position relative to each other of molecules, cells, tissues, and so on within an organism. In this example, we're thinking about the chloroplast and its structure relative to the function of photosynthesis. So here's a chloroplast, and the chloroplast is an organelle located within a cell, and the chloroplast itself has two outer membranes, an outer and an inner membrane that embrace the whole thing, and then within those membranes, there's another membrane system that's called the thylakoid membrane. And that thylakoid membrane is surrounded by the stroma. So you can sort of think of the stroma as sort of the cytoplasm of the chloroplast. That's really not a great accurate way to think about it, but it's a it's an analog. And importantly, the light reactions of photosynthesis occur within the walls of the thylakoid membrane. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. And the dark reactions, the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis occurs in the stroma. So those two main parts of photosynthesis, the light reactions and the dark reactions, are localized specifically to 
the thylakoid membrane, which is the light reactions, and the stroma, which is the dark reactions. Sometimes these stacks of disc-looking structures in the thylakoid membrane are called grana, and those are sometimes really visible on micrographs, for instance, and you'll see some examples later on. Let's talk about the absorption of photons. That's the first step in this process, first step in the light reactions. Sometimes the light reactions are called the energy transduction reactions because that's where the actual energy from photons is captured and transduced into essentially energy carrying compounds. Chlorophyll is the primary pigment that absorbs and captures photons and the energy from photons. And the two main forms of chlorophyll are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So you can see here on this graph, this shows the degree of absorbance of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B relative to different wavelengths. So just to remind you, within the context of what wavelengths we as humans can see, humans can see light in the wavelengths of around 400 to 700 nanometers. So this shows within the visible wavelengths, primarily chlorophyll absorbs in the vis visible wavelengths and primarily in the blue wavelengths and in the red wavelengths is primarily where, where chlorophyll absorbs. I want to do a little bit of a tangent for a second. These absorbances of chlorophyll have important implications, for instance, for remote sensing. Remote, for remote sensing, we, we sometimes rely on, for instance, infrared photography to sense vegetation. And that can be really useful because foliage reflects strongly in near infrared wavelengths, so in wavelengths just beyond that red zone. So what that means is that in infrared film like this, vegetation shows up like the green fields and the trees, vegetation shows up as a strong reflection. In this case, it's colored red. It's a false color infrared. We can't see infrared, but this type of film can be processed so that the infrared wavelengths show bright red as an example. Uh, another way that we use uh, those reflectance characteristics and absorbance characteristics of chlorophyll is, for instance, with multispectral sensors, which can detect reflections in multiple bands, we can use those, for instance, to develop composite indices like NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This is probably the most common multispectral index that's used to detect leaves. And NDVI works because red wavelengths are strongly absorbed by chlorophyll whereas near-infrared wavelengths are strongly reflected by chlorophyll. So creating an index like this, if there's lots of leaves, that will make um, the value of NDVI larger because the denominator will be smaller relative to um, a situation with not much vegetation. So it's the chemical composition of leaves relative to the absorbance characteristics of chlorophyll, for instance, that allows this type of remote sensing to work. So going back to chlorophyll, chlorophyll is embedded in the thylakoid membrane. So remember, the thylakoid membrane is that membrane system within the chloroplast, and now we're zooming in on that membrane itself. So this is the lipid membrane of the thylakoid membrane right here. This part is outside the thylakoid membrane. 
and the stroma is out there. And then the lumen is the part that's inside the thylakoid membrane system. And embedded in the thylakoid membrane are complexes in the case of PS1 and PS2, that's photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, those are composed of chlorophyll molecules. So photosystem 1, that has a peak absorption at about 700 nanometers, so it's sometimes called P700. And it consists of about 110 chlorophyll A molecules and a few chlorophyll B molecules. Whereas the photosystem two reaction, reaction center has a peak absorption at 680. It has 30 times more chlorophyll A than chlorophyll B. So you can see that chlorophyll A is the predominant chlorophyll in the light harvest or in the uh, photosystems. Now there are light harvesting complexes, which I don't believe show up here, but those are essentially light harvesting antenna uh, that are composed of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B with a greater abundance of chlorophyll B than in the photosystem one and two. So those light harvesting antenna serve to capture additional photo photons and filter their energy to the reaction centers of photosystem one and photosystem two. So when a photon is absorbed by a molecule of chlorophyll, there's basically one of three things that can happen. So when that photon is absorbed, the chlorophyll goes into an excited state. It basically absorbs most of the energy from that photon and exists in an excited state. And in, it can do one of three things with that energy. It can fall back to the unexcited state and just dissipate that energy as heat. A tiny amount of heat associated with the photon, but it can just dissipate that energy as heat. Another thing that can happen is that the chlorophyll molecule can emit a photon of light that's at a slightly longer wavelength than the wavelength of light that was absorbed and fall back to its unexcited state. So it's emitted that energy as a photon that's actually emitted. So it shines a little bit of light out. That emission of light from an excited chlorophyll molecule is called fluorescence. And we can actually measure chlorophyll fluorescence um, and use chlorophyll fluorescence as an index of the efficiency of the light reaction, specifically usually to photosystem two. So essentially, if the processes downstream of photosystem two are impaired in some way, either through stress or through damage to the thylakoid membrane or the photosystems, then there will be more fluorescence. So fluorescence is actually, an increase in fluorescence is an early signal of stress and impairment of the light reactions of photosynthesis. So there are instruments we can use to measure chlorophyll fluorescence. The more modern gas exchange systems like the Lycor 6800, for instance, often have a fluorescence unit built in to the unit itself so you can measure fluorescence at the same time as you're measuring net photosynthesis. Okay, so that's fluorescence. So then the third possibility for the energy from that excited state is that that energy is transferred through electron transport and is used to power photochemistry. And that is the energy that's captured for photosynthesis. So it's really that third fate of excited chlorophyll that's the important one for the function of the plant. So electron transport essentially 
is transmitting that energy that's captured by chlorophyll in the photosystems that causes water to be split so water is split and at that point oxygen is produced so this is where the O2 that's released from photosynthesis is produced it's in that splitting of water and in that process then hydrogen ions accumulate within the, the lumen of the thylakoid membrane along with that process of electron transport NADP has a hydrogen ion added onto it and NADPH is formed so this is what NADPH is a reducing factor that is one product of the light reactions of photosynthesis and NADPH is later used in the dark reactions of photosynthesis so that's one product so this should be an H plus that's a problem with this image this is an H plus we get hydrogen ions building up within the lumen of the thylakoid membrane and those hydrogen ions essentially flow out through this protein complex embedded in the mem thylakoid membrane I think of it as an analog as that's like the flow of water through the through the turbine electrical turbines on a dam so there's a gradient and hydrogen hydrogen ions between the thylakoid lumen and the stroman there's more hydrogen ions here than here and that flow of hydrogen ions represents energy flow and that energy flowing through that protein complex powers the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP so basically the energy from those captured the energy captured from photons is temporarily captured in the chemical bonds of NADPH and in ATP those are the two products of the light reaction of photosynthesis that are then used to essentially power the Calvin cycle or the dark reactions of photosynthesis so this is the second major part of photosynthesis it's the dark reactions it's also called the Calvin cycle named after one of the scientists that elucidated the series of biochemical reactions it's also in some textbooks called the carbon fixation reactions this is the set of reactions where carbon dioxide is captured and it initially right after the capture of carbon dioxide that carbon is within captured within a three carbon molecule called PGA that's what gives this pathway of photosynthesis its name this is C3 photosynthesis it's called C3 photosynthesis because the initial molecule after the capture of CO2 is has three carbons in it so that PGA then moves on and goes through a series of reactions that eventually produce sugars and other products and those reactions are driven by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions so the light reactions drive the energy requiring steps in the Calvin cycle so those two are coupled now the Calvin cycle occurs when it's light out in C3 photosynthesis it's just called the dark reactions because these specific reactions are not directly dependent on light now certainly they're dependent on products from the light reactions um, but they're not directly dependent on light and that that is why I think some books call these carbon fixation reactions because sometimes the dark reactions can be a little bit confusing now I want to focus on this first reaction well I'm not interested in having you memorize all of the reactions in the Calvin cycle but I think it is pretty important to focus on at least the first uh, 
reaction in the Calvin cycle. So I've focused in on it here. And this is the step which is where the capture of CO2 initially happens in the Calvin cycle. And in this step, RUBP is combined with CO2. And RUBP is ribulose bisphosphate. Ribulose bisphosphate is a five carbon phosphorylated sugar. Okay, so we've got a five carbon reactant here reacting with CO2 and it forms two PGA molecule, molecules. PGA is a three carbon molecule. So like I mentioned, that's why they call this three, uh, C3 photosynthesis. So our, our UBP is a five carbon phosphorylated sugar that's carboxylated. It has a carbon added on to it to form two three carbon subunits. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called Rubisco. A lot of enzymes are named after what they do. And that's the case with Rubisco. Rubisco stands for RUBP, so ribulose bisphosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase. Okay, my handwriting's not great on this, uh, either on a chalkboard or on a palette like this, but that's the full name of Rubisco. Rubisco is probably the most um, common protein on Earth. There's more Rubisco on Earth than any other protein on Earth. So Rubisco catalyzes this reaction and it catalyzes the carboxylase reaction. This is a carboxylase reaction because we're adding a carbon onto that five carbon unit. So Rubisco is, is really port, important in catalyzing that reaction. So what does the oxygenase part mean? So Rubisco can also act as an oxygenase. So it, rather than reacting with CO2, it can react with oxygen. When Rubisco acts, reacts with oxygen, it goes down this pathway. So the pathway we just looked at, this is the pathway we just looked at. So this is the product of that first reaction of the Calvin cycle. And then the Calvin cycle proceeds and CO2 is fixed. However, if instead of reacting with the CO2 molecule, Rubisco reacts with an oxygen molecule, we go down this pathway and we produce only one PGA molecule that gets fed into the Calvin cycle. But then that reaction also results in the release of a CO2. So there's no net gain in carbon when an O2 uh, molecule reacts with Rubisco. This pathway where Rubisco is oxygenase, ox, acts as an oxygenase instead of a carboxylase, that pathway is called photorespiration. So photorespiration is what happens when Rubisco act, reacts with oxygen instead of um, a CO2 molecule. So 20% of the time, Rubisco acts as an oxygenase instead of a carboxylase. So that means that Rubisco is only 80% efficient, which is not very efficient for a biological enzyme. And there's been some questions uh, over time in terms of how can such an inefficient enzyme persist? Because Rubisco is almost ubiquitous in photosynthetic organisms from 
uh, photosynthetic bacterium all the way to redwoods. Rubisco is pretty much the same, and it's pretty much as inefficient. And the likely explanation is that Rubisco evolved and essentially was fixed in place during a time when the atmosphere had much less oxygen in it. So it essentially when it evolved, this inefficiency didn't exist because there was very little oxygen in the atmosphere. But because photosynthesis then became very successful and widespread, the release of oxygen from photosynthesis resulted in the oxygenation of the atmosphere. So um, essentially, Rubisco evolved during a time when there wasn't much oxygen and therefore photorespiration was not common, common. So photorespiration becomes more prominent when the relative concentration of CO2 uh, becomes less. So for instance, when there's stomatal closure and CO2 within intercellular spaces in the leaf is uh, declines, that leads to more photorespiration. So during periods of water stress, um, photorespiration becomes more common. When temperatures increase, that tends to increase the affinity of Rubisco for oxygen as well. So stomatal closure or high temperatures tends to favor that photorespiration or um, inefficiency of Rubisco. That inefficiency of the Rubisco enzyme has helped to drive evolution of a couple of alternative pathways of photosynthesis. So we've been talking about the C3 pathway up to this point, and that is the, the pathway used by trees. When we talk about tree photosynthesis, it's C3 photosynthesis. These alternative pathways are, are generally used by some other plant types, but I think it is important to at least be familiar with them and understand them. So one of the alternative pathways is the C4 pathway. C4 just refers to the fact that when CO2 is initially fixed in this pathway, rather than, than reacting with Rubisco, it reacts with a different enzyme called PEP carboxylase. And the resulting molecule, rather than being a three carbon molecule, is a four carbon molecule. So eventually, oxal oxaloacetate uh, and malate are formed, which are essentially temporary holding molecules for that captured carbon. And those holding molecules are then transported uh, into specialized cells called bundle sheath cells. And then in those bundle sheath cells, CO2 is released and fed into the Calvin cycle, and the Calvin cycle proceeds just like in C3 photosynthesis. So basically C4 photosynthesis has this additional set of reactions on the front end that occur. So these additional set of reactions occur that fix, initially fix the CO2, and then CO2 is released within the bundle sheath cells. And what that does is that elevates the CO2 concentration to really high concentrations. And basically under those really high CO2 concentrations, no photorespiration occurs. So the Calvin cycle occurs under really high CO2 concentrations and that photorespiratory inefficiency is eliminated. So here's a diagram that shows those bundle sheath cells with basically surround the vascular bundles in C4 plants. Um, so sometimes people talk about C4 as having the initial capture of CO2, which occurs in these mesophyll cells, being spatially separated from the Calvin cycle. So um, that's one way of thinking about C4 photosynthesis. Some examples of C4 photosynthesis, a lot of grasses are C4 plants. 
Um, corn is a C4. Corn is just another kind of grass. Now, uh, monocot trees like palms uh, are sort of grassy, but they do C3 photosynthesis. So um, there are some woody shrubs that do C4 photosynthesis, but as far as I know, there aren't any trees that perform C4 photosynthesis. The other alternative pathway is CAM. So um, CAM stands for Crashulation Acid Metabolism. And that's the other alternative pathway. With CAM, in CAM plants, so this is basically shows what happens at night and in the day for CAM plants. So at night, the stomata open in CAM plants. So this is the exact opposite of C3 and C4 plants where stomata are open during the day and closed at night. In CAM plants, CO2 open at night and at night, CO2 enters the leaves and is fixed into, again, malate and then stored as malic acid. So that's the acid that's referred to in CAM, crassulation acid metabolism. So basically these malic acid builds up at night and that's basically a temporary storage of that captured those captured carbons at night. Then during the day, the stomata close. But at the daytime, that triggers the release of CO2 from that malic acid. And then that CO2 enters the chloroplasts and the Calvin cycle proceeds. Calvin cycle and actually the light reactions of photosynthesis proceeds in the light. But, this, but basically the stomata are closed and all of this happens under elevated CO2 during the day. And again, because it's under elevated CO2, very little um, photorespiration happens. So um, Rubisco operates at higher efficiencies. And so with that closure of stomata during the day for cam plants, that tells you that that's a very water use efficient pathway. So what that means is that these plants are very efficient with water use. So the types of plants that we see that use CAM are things like succulents. So I went out in my front yard, a uh, Christmas cactus that I have in my front yard. Uh, that's a CAM plant. I also have some pineapples in my front yard. Those are cam and also a lot of like desert cacti um, are very water use efficient and use the cam pathway. So again, really not any trees that utilize cam, um, but some of these succulents and desert cacti use cam. Now, because of the inefficiencies associated with photorespiration and the inefficiency of Rubisco, there have recently been some attempts to use biotechnology uh, to deal with those inefficiencies in C3 plants. So this is one example of genetic engineering, South et al. 2019, I believe in tobacco. There are also, uh, I think, are some other references in your papers, uh, Shen et al. 2019 and Rains 2006, talking about efforts to modify the genome of C3 plants to reduce or eliminate those inefficiencies and allow more carbon gain. And the idea is better growth in transformed plants. None of this is operational yet, but this is uh, at the research stage right now.